Hi, my name is Ben Whitaker. I'm Professor of Chemical Physics at the University of Leeds. I've been asked to explain how a time of flight mass spectrometer works. Let's just review what mass spectrometry is about. Mass spectrometry gives us information about the elemental composition of molecules and their structure. It does this by first ionizing a molecule, often with a beam of electrons, but you could also use a pulse of ultraviolet light, and then separating the ions produced according to their charge to mass ratio. There are essentially two ways to do this, either by using an electric or a magnetic field. In a traditional mass spectrometer, a large electromagnet is used to deflect a beam of ions. By changing the current in the coils of the magnet, ions with different charge to mass ratio can be steered through the instrument to record the mass spectrum. With powerful magnets, very high resolution can be achieved, which allows one to study very high molecular weight molecules, such as biological polymers, proteins, and sugars. But there are also disadvantages. The ions are recorded mass by mass as the magnetic field is tuned, which means that it can take a long time to record the spectrum. And to achieve high mass resolution, narrow slits have to be employed, which reduces the throughput of ions. The machines are also pretty big, often several meters long, and expensive. There are other ways of employing magnetic fields to separate ions of different masses, and nowadays, you're unlikely to see a magnetic sector instrument in a chemistry laboratory. The other way to build a mass spectrometer is to use an electric field to, to accelerate and separate the ions. And this is what is done in a time of flight mass spectrometer. To explain how it works, imagine two conducting plates in a vacuum separated by a distance d. If we apply a voltage to one of the plates, we will create an electric field. Now imagine that we create a positive ion somewhere in between the two plates, say by directing a fast beam of electrons through a very dilute sample of gas phase molecules between the two plates. The potential energy of the ion is equal to its charge, Q, times the strength of the electric field at the point where it was created. That's SE. Because there is a field gradient between the two plates, and because charges, like charges, repel one another, the ion will feel a force that pushes it towards the grounded plate. Potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy. And by the time the ion reaches the grounded plate, it will have acquired a velocity v. You may have noticed that I've uh, cut a small hole in the ground plate to let the ion through. And if the hole is small enough, uh, its presence won't substantially alter the field gradient between the two plates. Another way to let the ions through is to make the grounded electrode out of a very fine wire mesh. Anyway, the upshot is that the ion leaves the region between the two electrodes. When it does so, it will have a uniform velocity v, and we can work out exactly what that is by equating the potential and the kinetic energy terms and solving for v. The answer is that v equals the square root of twice the initial potential energy divided by the mass. In other words, the velocity of the ion as it leaves the ion source region is simply proportional to the square root of the charge to mass ratio. Well, this is the essential characteristic of a time of flight mass spectrometer. Each ion of the same charge acquires the same kinetic energy from the electric field. This means that its velocity is simply proportional to 1 over the square root of its mass. At its simplest, the basic design of a time-of-flight mass spectrometer consists of an evacuated tube with an iron source at one end and a detector at the other. The time taken for an iron to travel from one end of the tube to the other only depends on its velocity when it leaves the source region, as there are no forces acting on it from the moment an iron leaves the source until it arrives at the detector. We've already worked out the velocity in terms of the field, and with a little bit more algebra, we can easily work out the flight time. We discover that the flight time between the ion leaving the source and arriving at the detector is proportional to the square root of its mass. Now, the detector is something like an electron multiplier. It amplifies the charge falling on it, and it turns it into a voltage that we can easily measure on an oscilloscope. For example, if we bleed a very dilute sample of and butane into the iron source, we might see a trace on the oscilloscope, something like this. Each peak corresponds to an iron of a different mass 
strictly mass to charge ratio, but usually all the ions are singly charged. Notice that we get a number of peaks corresponding to ions of different masses, and not just one peak at mass 44. N-butane is three carbon atoms and eight hydrogen atoms, and three times 12 plus eight is 44. The reason we get several peaks is because the pulsed electron beam that was used to create the ions deposits a lot of energy into the molecule and causes it to fragment as well as ionize. Although, at first sight, this might be considered a rather annoying feature, it's actually quite useful, as the fragmentation pattern contains a lot of structural information, because certain functional groups are more stable than others. Another thing to notice is that the resolution, that is, the ability of the spectrometer to separate one mass from another, decreases as the ions become heavier and heavier, and that's because of the square root factor. The mass peaks get closer and closer together for longer flight times. The advantage of a time-of-flight mass spectrometer over a traditional sector instrument is that they're relatively easy to build, and the throughput is quite high because there aren't any slits and so forth. Most importantly, the whole mass spectrum can be acquired quickly. Typically, the flight tube might be 50 centimeters long, so for our N-butane iron, the flight time is about 10 microseconds. Let's calculate the typical flight time for, for this instrument. We have that uh, T, the flight time, is equal to um, D times the square root of D. Uh, D is the length of the flight tube. D is the uh, distance between the two plates, divided by the square root of 2 times S times V. S is the distance uh, that the iron was created from the grounded plate, and V is the voltage on the two plates, uh, times the square root of the mass to charge ratio. So typical values that we might use are that the flight tube is 50 centimeters long. That's equal to half a meter, since we're going to work in SI units. D, the distance between the two plates, might typically be 2 centimeters, 0 0.02 meters. And S, let's create the iron halfway between the two plates. So S is equal to 1 centimeter equals 0 0.01. Uh, for n-butane, the mass is equal to 44 atomic mass units, and Q is the charge, the elemental charge, Q, is equal to 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. One atomic mass unit is 44 times 10 to the 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Well, if we put those numbers into the equation, we'll calculate a time of flight of about 10 microseconds, 10 to 11 microseconds. So that's a calculation that you might try for yourselves. Time of flight mass spectrometers have been about since shortly after World War II. But in 1955, Wiley and McLaren realized that the resolution could be dramatically improved by two innovations. Firstly, by having two acceleration regions rather than one. And secondly, by introducing a time delay between creating the ions and extracting them. Here is a copy of the first page of William McLaren's original paper, published in the Review of Scientific Instruments, a journal that is still going strong today. This paper has over 2,000 citations in the scientific literature, which gives you an indication of how influential it was. Now, the first in innovation that they introduced is called space focusing. In this simple instrument I described, the ions aren't created at a unique point between the electrodes because the electron beam that was used to create them will have a certain width. This means that for any given charge to mass ratio, there will be a range of flight times that will blur the spectrum, particularly for the higher mass ions causing one mass peak to overlap with the next. What Wiley and McLaren realized is that the ions created near the Rapallo electrode will get a larger acceleration and hence achieve a higher speed than ions created further away. So although these ions have further to fly, they travel faster. By adding a second acceleration region and carefully choosing the gaps between the two sets of electrodes and by adjusting the two voltages, Wiley and McLaren showed that you could arrange things just so, so that wherever the ions 
of the same charge to mass ratio are created in the source region, they will take exactly the same time to reach the detector. This is what the inside of a Wiley and McLaren time of flight mass spectrometer looks like. Here is the repeller electrode. Here is the electrode that we call the extractor electrode, the intermediate electrode that is used to space focus the ions, and here is the ground electrode. The detector would go about here. The second innovation introduced by Wiley and McLaren is something called time lag focusing. By introducing a time delay between the moment ions are created and the application of the accelerating fields, one can compensate for the spread of initial velocities of the gas molecules. Remember that in a gas, molecules are all moving at different speeds according to something called the Maxwell-Boltzmann velocity distribution. It's not important what it's called, but the fact that the molecules are all moving at different speeds also blurs the time of flight. And you can compensate this for this with delayed extraction. Although delayed extraction is still used in some instruments, a more modern way of achieving the same effect, and one which has additional advantages, is to use something called a reflectron. A reflectron is the equivalent of a mirror in optics. Actually, it's the equivalent of something called a chirped mirror in conventional optics. It works in the following way. A reflectron consists of a set of ring electrodes with a constant potential difference between them, from ground to some positive voltage. An ion approaching the reflectron will, experience, will not experience a force until it passes the first ring, which is at ground, and hence shields the ions from the field behind it. But as the ion enters the reflectron, it sees a repulsive force that increases the further in it goes, and so it's reflected, just like light from a mirror. However, if the ion has a slightly larger, or slightly smaller, than average velocity, it approaches the reflectron and will penetrate further or less and see a larger or smaller repulsion. The net result is that ions entering the reflectron with different speeds arrive at the detector at the same time. Now, this effect can considerably improve the resolution of a time of flight instrument. And because the ion trajectories are now folded back on themselves, it can lead to the construction of a compact instrument that still has a, the, a long effective flight path. Reflectron iron mirrors are at the heart of many modern time of flight spectrometer designs. And a popular configuration for biochemical applications is MALDI TOF. MALDI stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. Take another lecture to fully describe it. But the essential idea is the following. A sample, perhaps a protein or a carbohydrate, is mixed with another low molecular weight and easily ionizable compound and deposited on, onto the surface of an electrode. This is called the matrix. A short pulse of light, less than a microsecond long, from an ultraviolet laser is used to ionize the low molecular weight compound, which is in large excess. The heating effect from the laser causes the now ionized matrix molecules to be desorbed from the surface, and they carry with them some of the sample molecules. Charge exchange reactions ionize the sample, importantly without depositing a large amount of energy, and the now ionized sample is accelerated towards the reflectron and eventually the detector. Very high mass resolution can be obtained, and molecules with masses of several tens of thousands of Daltons can be analyzed. I'd like to finish by describing another rather different application of time-of-flight mass spectrometry. In my laboratory in Leeds, we use time-of-flight mass spectrometry to study chemical reactivity at the quantum resolve level using a technique called velocity map imaging. Here is a diagram of the spectrometer. At its heart is a variant of the uh, Wiley McLaren arrangement of electrodes, with an iron source at one end and a detector at the other. A stream of neutral molecules is directed into the spectrometer. We call this a molecular beam. And a pulse of light is shone into the source region through a window in the, vacuum in the vacuum chamber. And the light interacts with the molecules in the beam and breaks them into atomic and molecular fragments. The idea behind our experiment is this. It's a bit like a chemical reaction in reverse. Instead of atoms coming together to make a molecule, we study the reaction the other way around. Our goal is to understand how the reaction works by measuring the internal energy in the fragments. Imagine breaking a bond in a triatomic molecule. We make an atom and a diatomic fragment. But the question is, 
Is the diatomic fragment vibrating or rotating? Or maybe most of the energy went into translational energy? Other questions are, do all triatomic molecules work in the same way? What's about the dissociation of more complicated molecules? And what can we learn about the interactions that, fundament that fundamentally hold molecules together and make chemistry happen? Well, we can begin to start answering these questions by sending in a second pulse of light to ionize one of the fragments shortly after the first pulse created them. It turns out we can do this very specifically by carefully choosing the wavelength of the ionizing light. In fact, we can choose the wavelength in such a way that not only do we select the fragment chemically, but we only ionize fragments in particular quantum states. We get very specific information from this experiment. So, we make the ions in a specific quantum state, and they get accelerated and time-focused onto the detector, just like in a Wiley mclaren spectrometer. But our electrostatic lens has another property, called velocity focusing. Ions traveling with the same speed radially outwards from the fragmentation region are focused onto the same radius on the detector. The detector itself is a special kind of camera, and the images we record are a map of the radial velocity of the ionized fragments. Here are some maps of the velocity of atomic oxygen fragments following the photofragmentation of nitrogen dioxide at various wavelengths. There's clearly a great deal going on here, and it took quite a bit of time and a number of publications to explain it all, so I won't attempt that now. But you should be able to see a number of rings in each of the images. Each ring corresponds to the oxygen atom, which we've measured, being produced in coincidence with nitric oxide fragments in different quantum states. The rings have different sizes because different quantum states carry away different amounts of kinetic energy. If nothing else, these images are a very clear demonstration that energy in molecules is stored in discrete quanta.